The New Mexico State Penitentiary Riot was the most violent revolt in U.S. prison history. It took place on the 2nd and 3rd of February, 1980. By the time police regained control, after 36 hours of mayhem, 33 inmates were dead and over 200 injured. The prison had been a tinderbox waiting to catch fire. Serious overcrowding had long been a problem. Close to 1,200 prisoners were in the facility on the night of the riot. The prison was designed for only about 950. Many prisoners slept on the floor in dormitories, and first-time offenders, convicted for minor crimes, were not segregated from some of the worst criminals in the state. Recreational and educational programs had been dropped in 1975, resulting in longer lockdowns for inmates and deepened rage against the prison system. Conditions were horrendous. The food was poor. Cell blocks were infested with vermin and cockroaches. Officer brutality was a problem. Inmates reported being kicked and struck when being transferred between different areas of the prison. A work strike against poor conditions in 1976 saw prisoners tear-gassed, stripped naked, and beaten with axe handles. Prison authorities deliberately set inmates against each other in a policy known as the snitch game. A so-called snitch jacket would be placed on troublesome prisoners or to coerce those inmates thought to be in possession of information that would be useful to inform on others. Inmate on inmate violence increased and scores would be settled once the riots began. The understaffed guards felt threatened during night counts. As a result, security procedures were not adhered to. Doors were left open to facilitate a quick escape in the event of trouble. On the night of the riot, prisoners had been drinking hooch they had made on the unguarded blocks. The plan had been hatched during this time, the idea being to jump the guards on the 1am count if they didn't lock the door behind them. Sure enough, the door was left open and the prisoners pounced, seizing three officers making the count and the officer manning the cell door. The rioters headed straight for the control room and despite the glass being supposedly bulletproof, smashed their way in. They now had complete control of the prison and access to every key. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel, and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. The two main gangs in the prison, the Chicanos and the Aryan Brotherhood, settled scores as soon as they were released. A group known as the Execution Squad, headed for cell block 4, were informers, sex offenders, and other prisoners that had been marked for death were held. Stopping along the way at the psychology wing to load up on drugs, which they either consumed or shared out for later, they were high and thirsty for revenge when they arrived at cell block 4. However, they didn't have the correct keys for the cells. It seemed as if the block 4 prisoners would be saved. Unfortunately for them, Contractors working on renovations to cell block 5 had left behind oxyacetylene torches, which the prisoners used to break in. The terrified inmates in cell block 4 had to listen as the mob got closer and closer to getting into their cells, one by one. Block 4 inmates screamed desperately to the state police outside, as there was a back door that could have been opened, potentially facilitating an escape. But the state police had agreed with hostage negotiators not to enter, since it may have prompted the rioters to harm or kill the officers who were still being held hostage. They watched on helplessly as a total of 16 inmates were tortured and killed by about noon on Saturday morning. Later that afternoon, a fire that had been started in the gymnasium spread to cell block 3, threatening three of the officer hostages who were being held there. This intensified negotiations, 
which the prison authorities had initiated about 2.30am on the Saturday morning. The prisoners demanded reform of conditions, that no charges be brought against them, and to be interviewed by the media. The authorities wanted the safe release of all hostages. Negotiations broke off on Saturday evening, resumed on Sunday morning, and by mid-afternoon, the riot was over, officers had been released, and police entered the prison. Water and fire damage was extensive. Then the police came upon the horrific scenes of the remains of the murdered inmates, many of whom were too badly disfigured to be immediately identified. New Mexico's Attorney General was commissioned to report on the riot, and his findings ran to 200 pages. He concluded that the prison regime had made violent criminals even more brutal. It also emerged that the riot was orchestrated by a small number of inmates, and that the vast majority of prisoners were actually trying to flee the mayhem for their own safety. Not all of the 33 deaths were murders. A number of inmates had died from drug overdoses. Several prisoners were charged with murder. None were convicted due to a lack of evidence. There were convictions for other offences. The longest sentence added for the riot was nine years. No discernible change in prison conditions took place in the aftermath. It wasn't until a change of governor in New Mexico that any meaningful reforms occurred in the years following the riot. The building continued to deteriorate and the penitentiary was slowly wound down, then eventually closed in 1998. In 2013, the building was open for visitor tours. The New Mexico State Penitentiary stands as a monument to brutality and inhumanity, both from the authorities and from inmates who rampaged out of control for 36 hours, displaying how far humans can sink into the depths of depravity. When Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis on the 4th of April 1968, it was yet another traumatic political assassination in 60s America. His assassin, James R. Ray, would join the likes of Lee Harvey Oswald in infamy. Unlike Oswald, Ray would not be captured on the day of the assassination and would evade a huge manhunt for months. Ray's motivation for killing King was racial hatred, but he was a cunning and experienced criminal in his own right. Following the assassination, Ray drove to Atlanta, ditched his car, then boarded a bus for Detroit, using the name Eric S. Galt. Once there, he boarded a bus for Windsor, Canada, and from there to Toronto. Ray was familiar with Canada, he had taken advantage of the Montreal World Fair to go on a robbery spree there in 1967. He favoured Toronto this time, though, fearing that he would not blend in as easily in French Canada. To avoid suspicion, Ray rented two rooms at separate locations and stayed eight hours at each. It took a full week before he saw his name in the Canadian media. By then... He had already acquired a false Canadian birth certificate and passport by researching old newspapers. Apprehension nearly came when he was stopped by a policeman for jaywalking, but the false address he gave was not checked. As a precaution, he took two new false identities. In an era when computer databases didn't exist, he easily obtained duplicate birth certificates, then called the real person posing as a passport official. When they said they didn't have one, he apologised for the error, then promptly applied for a passport in their name. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel, and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. Ray's long-term game plan was to make his way to Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, which had no extradition treaty with the U.S. Once there, 
he fancied that he could fight for white supremacy as a mercenary. It was an absurd idea, but he had few options. He bought a ticket to London, and after waiting for his new passport, flew there on the 6th of May 1968, passing through the airport unchallenged. He flew on to Lisbon, having got the idea that mercenaries for Africa were recruited there. Unable to find a connection, he flew back to London ten days later, holing up in an Earl's Court flop house for two pounds a night. Despite the modest accommodation, Ray was low on cash. He robbed a bank near the hotel, but came away with only a hundred pounds. An attempted robbery at a jewellery store had to be aborted, after the owners tripped an alarm. In a desperate move, Ray called the foreign desk at the Daily Telegraph, asking for the contact name of anyone hiring mercenaries. Amazingly, he was given the name of someone in Brussels and quickly made arrangements to fly there. By this time, one of his Canadian aliases had been blown and the FBI knew he was in London, but that was not what caught him. On embarkation for the 8th of June flight from London to Brussels, a sharp-eyed immigration officer, Kenneth Human, noticed that when Ray took his passport from his wallet, there was another one inside. Even after the police intervened, Ray almost talked his way out of it, as the identity of his false passport was not on any watch list. But the game was up. Martin Luther King's assassin had evaded the authorities for two months. Had this veteran criminal not made a rookie mistake at Heathrow, he may have made it to Rhodesia and escaped justice for the murder of one of the great unifying figures of the 20th century. On the night of the 14th to 15th of May 1982, during the Falklands War, British Special Forces launched a raid on Pebble Island, a small outcrop to the north of West Falkland. The Argentine Air Force was using the island as a forward operating base, with aircraft that posed a significant threat to the British task force that had arrived to retake the islands. Following the Argentine invasion, their establishment of the Pebble Island base threw a wrench in British military plans. Proposed landings to retake West Falkland could be compromised, both by the reconnaissance aircraft there and by IA-38 Pucara and T-34 Mentor ground attack jets that were capable of harassing ground forces. The raid was to be led by the legendary Special Air Service, or SAS, who were tasked with eliminating the threat by destroying as many aircraft as possible. Although the SAS were operating behind enemy lines, they did have fire support offshore from the destroyer HMS Glamorgan. Initial plans were for D Squadron of the SAS to be inserted and not only destroy planes, but also the radar station and the garrison protecting it. This operation was reckoned to require 90 minutes. However, when members of the Special Boat Service conducted reconnaissance, they found strong headwinds in the area that would limit any potential insertion to around 30 minutes due to increased flying time. With this in mind, the priority became the destruction of aircraft, with any collateral damage a bonus. During the night of the 14th of May, two Westland Sea King helicopters, part of the Commando Helicopter Force, departed with 45 members of D Squadron SAS on board. The raiding party was inserted 3.7 miles, or 6 kilometres, from the airstrip. Unloaded with them were over 100 mortars, explosive charges and Laws rockets. The men carried M16s and some had grenade launchers. There's lots more to come in this video. But please consider liking, subscribing to the channel, and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. On approaching the base, the raiders encountered a sentry 
but were not seen. Part of the force were able to approach the targets and lay charges on seven aircraft, while the rest of the squadron secured the approaches to the airstrip to protect them. The team then opened fire on the aircraft, shooting away the undercarriage of several. That was the signal for HMS Glamorgan to bombard the Argentine garrison with high explosive rounds, which also detonated the ammunition dump and fuel stores. The SAS had expected to come under attack from the Argentines, but weren't engaged by the defenders until they had formed up away from the airfield and were ready to move out. This led to later speculation that the Argentine Marines garrisoning the airstrip didn't fancy taking on the SAS. The Argentines countered that their forces were sheltering from the bombardment and unable to initially mount an attack. Given that Argentine units had often displayed plenty of courage in other engagements of the Falklands War, this speculation seems perhaps a little unfair. After a brief firefight, the SAS repulsed the Argentine attack and successfully exfiltrated the area, returning in time to the pickup point, despite being slowed by having to carry one member of the team who had been hit by shrapnel. The raid was deemed a complete success. In addition to the arms dump and fuel store destruction, six IA-58s, one training aircraft, and one transport were destroyed. Though the base was now a lame duck, Argentine units were forced to remain there before finally being picked up later in the war. The final troops left the island by helicopter on the 1st of June. The raid on Pebble Island was typical of the huge difference that special forces can make in any conflict. Though the engagements are often small, and often secret until many years later, their strategic value is immense. By destroying Pebble Island's ability to monitor British movements in the area, the SAS undoubtedly saved the lives of many of their comrades and shortened the battle for West Falkland. The story of Finland during World War II is an extraordinary one. Initially defending themselves against an attack from the Soviet Union, they then fought on the same side as Nazi Germany, before finally switching allegiance and fighting with the Allies against Hitler. Finland's complex relations were rooted in its history of occupation and domination by other countries. For almost 700 years, Finland was part of Sweden. In the Finnish War of 1809, between Sweden and Russia, Finland entered into an autonomous union with the Russian Empire, and from this time forward, the country prospered. But the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 appeared to threaten Finland's situation. The country's parliament declared independence, a declaration the overstretched Bolsheviks were forced to accept. Parliament ordered Russian troops and local communists to disarm, leading to the Finnish Civil War, which was decided when German troops on the Eastern Front entered Helsinki. A subsequent purge of Red Guards led to the deaths of over 12,000 people. The new government of Prime Minister Juho Kusti Pasikivi pursued a pro-German policy. After the Bolshevik victory in the Russian Civil War, Finland and Russia convened to decide the border between the two countries. The result was uneasy for both sides, and disputes remained, most notably concerning Russian Karelia, which had a Finnish-speaking majority, despite never being part of Finland. Fast-forwarding 20 years to the signing of the infamous Molotov-Ribbentrop non-aggression pact between Hitler and Stalin, Finland was part of the secret carve-up of Europe that the two tyrants envisaged. Following its completion, the Soviets made territorial demands of Finland that the latter had no intention of accommodating. On the 26th of November, the Red Army carried out a false flag operation, claiming that the Finns had shelled a Russian village, which they had shelled themselves. On the 30th of November, 
the Soviet Union invaded, a move that resulted in their expulsion from the League of Nations. The so-called Winter War had begun. The nine divisions of the Finnish Army faced 16 divisions of the Red Army, with the Soviets also enjoying total armour and air superiority. Finland also had to contend with defending a 1,287-kilometre frontier. In the initial stages, the Soviets advanced and attempted a pincer movement to encircle the defenders. But by late December, they had been stopped in their tracks by the performance of a Finnish army, which exceeded all expectations. A renewed Soviet offensive in 1940 forced the Finns to the peace treaty table, and they were eventually obliged to accept territorial concessions that exceeded those originally demanded. A lull had been secured, but Finland was under no illusions that the Soviets would be back for more. The Finns made frantic attempts at a diplomatic and military understanding with both Britain and Sweden, to no avail. The only possible arrangement left was with the Nazis. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel, and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. Finland's situation was a gift to Hitler, having never had any intention of upholding the non-aggression pact with Stalin. By the summer of 1941, Operation Barbarossa, the plan to steamroll the Soviet Union, was ready to roll. He was happy to have the Finns on board. As Barbarossa began, the Soviets retaliated with air raids on Finnish cities. Finland declared war and allowed German troops stationed in Finland to attack the Soviet Union. So began what is known in Finland as the Continuation War. Finnish troops quickly regained the territory previously lost, and then some, participating in the blockading of Leningrad, though failing to take the vital port of Murmansk. Now all of a sudden, on the 4th of August 1941, the Soviets wanted peace with Finland. But the Finns weren't falling for that one. By December, Great Britain had declared war on Finland, though this was largely symbolic. At this point, Finland's armies dug into defensive positions. For almost three years, the Finnish front line was relatively quiet. Then on the 9th of June 1944, the Red Army launched a major offensive that pushed the Finns back to pre-continuation war positions. Eventually, the Soviet offensive was fought to a standstill in the Battle of Tali Ihantala. But as in the Winter War, prospects for defending a second offensive were bleak. Finnish President Rusto Riti gave Germany his personal guarantee that Finland would not negotiate peace with the Soviet Union for as long as he was president. In exchange, Germany delivered weapons to the Finns. After the Soviet offensive was halted, however, Riti resigned. With elections impossible due to the war, the Parliament selected the Marshal of Finland, Carl Gustav Emil Mannheim, the Finnish Commander-in-Chief, as President, and charged him with negotiating a peace. The Soviets were preoccupied with the race to Berlin, and had received a few bloody noses from the Finnish army, so quickly signed a ceasefire in September 1944, moving vital troops from the Finnish frontier to charge towards the German capital. They did, however, insist that Finland pressure remaining German troops to leave Finnish territory. Some remained in Lapland, refusing to withdraw to Norway, resulting in the short Lapland War. German troops were forced out and instituted a scorched-earth policy as they left. At the end of the war, Finland was designated as an ally of Nazi Germany and punished with reparations and territorial loss with the final peace treaty signed in Paris in February 1947. Throughout the Cold War, they were neutral and received assurances from the Soviet Union that their territory and neutrality would not be breached. Finland siding with Nazis for parts of World War II should not be seen too harshly. 
They were abandoned by European democracies and forced into one tyrant's arms by the threat of another. Their army was outside the German command structure. They fought only against the Red Army and latterly against the Nazis. Finnish Jews were not persecuted or deported, although in 2000 the Finnish government apologised for an incident where eight of the 500 Jewish refugees in Finland were handed over to the Germans. Inside Finland, the continuation war is hotly debated, but many realise that it was a war of self-preservation, an alliance of convenience as a last resort, and that they made the best that they could of a deal with the devil.